Okie dokie. Um, we are here for our neurology live Q and A. So, you know, this is about dogs and cats with neurological problems, seizures, balance problems, intervertebral disc disease, FCEs, degenerative myelopathy, uh, the, the whole nine yards. That's what uh, we get excited about and what we know about. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Wong, and I've got Chris Levine here of Levine Veterinary Neurology over in Sarasota. Um, Chris, if you want to introduce yourself, or Dr. Levine. Hi, I'm Chris. I am a board certified neurologist uh, practicing out of Levine Veterinary Neurology in Sarasota, Florida, just like you said. And we've been open three years and love collaborating with Seven. You guys are fantastic. I, I, I can't believe it's been three years all, all, already and um, time flies. I guess, what, what, what's the thing you've learned most about uh, uh, about veterinary neurology as a practice owner that you know you you, you weren't necessarily prepared for uh, in your residency. <laughs> the business aspect aspect of everything. Delegate to anyone else if you possibly can. Yeah, definitely. And 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 what's the the, the I, you 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 seem really uh, upbeat about it. I guess what's the what's what's the best part of of owning a practice and you know because I, I think a lot of people think about it you know a lot of people are like heck no but a lot of people think about it i guess what would you speak to them a little bit oh it's as much of a frustration and headache there are sometimes it is such a joy and pleasure to be able to give back to the community work with staff members bring on amazing team members and really try to mold people and guide their careers as technicians and then as an owner, we can help owners. We can manipulate things. We can make adjustments and make things feasible for owners to do. And when you see the positive responses that your pet owners and your pets are experiencing, it just, it's heartwarming. Yeah. And that's, that's what we get up four in the morning. Even at four in the morning, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yes. Been, been there, done that. Still, still doing it. I was, uh, I, I came in at around 11 o'clock last night for, a. Uh, uh, weekly or well, non-ambulatory palm ski, but it turned out to be a, a, a non-surgical problem. So, um, so for, for those who watched this before, you know, we, we we want this to be as valuable as possible. So please put your your questions in the comments, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. I feel like the last two weeks we've been able to get to you know ninety plus percent of them. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, and. Just everyone understand there's only so much we can answer and, and, and Dr. Levine, let, let, let you off the hook here that, you know, there's, there's only so much we can answer without being able to see your pet in person, lay our hands on them, you know, evaluate them in person, go through the records, et cetera. So, um, you know, please understand when we give our, our answers, we're, we're trying to be as much or give as much value as possible um, within the constraints of, of what we're able to do. So, um, we're, we're expecting Bunny, uh, a two-year-old English bulldog, in, in just a little bit. Um, but before that, we've got a question uh, from Jesse. Seven-year-old Doxy Jasper has severe allergies, which trigger his, his anxiety. He takes Cabrovet, Kepra 750 extended release, and CBD oil for seizure control. I need to find balance for his allergies and epilepsy. Worried about um, allergy medications. Uh, can you tell me if Apoquil is okay to take or what recommendations do you have for Jasper? So, um, so yeah, if, if you want to take a crack at this, I, I'd be, be interested in your, um, take one on, on Apoquil and seizures, because I, I feel like I, uh, get a fair amount of those questions, um, as well as, um, if, if you're comfortable tackling the, the question on CBD oil, we, we kind of do it every every week we're on here so yeah. so in my practice what I tend to say is in dogs that have seizures we always want to find out is there a reason for them because that can target our therapies more directly and maybe be able to reduce some of the other supplements that we're using like CBDs um, but for your, your allergies allergies are tough and I know where you're located if you're here in Florida since moving here my dogs have just been horrific with their allergies. So uh, a lot of manipulating different medications, diets, limiting environmental exposures, going with allergy injections, even seeing dermatologists and doing allergy testing. But for 
your direct question of is apple call okay to take i rarely see any major interactions or increase in seizure frequency in my epileptic dogs when we're taking apple call. it works on a fairly different pathway than anything else and i have definitely no problem with it um, as far as your cbd goes i can't buy the book, recommend CBD oils for, for federal regulations, but I have a lot of owners that use different CBD products and have good success with. There are good studies coming out of Cornell, Colorado, and even UF that CBD products can reduce the frequency of seizures. Uh, it's not going to do much for your allergies, in my opinion, but I use the combinations all the time of your Cabrovet, Kepra, CBD oils, and Apoquil all concurrently. So I think it's a okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, with, with the, the CBD oil, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It's the, uh, you know, we, we, we can't, can't be recommending it yet, but you know, I, I often say, ask me in five years, once the studies are out, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll know a lot more. So, um, excited about that stuff. So I, I, I see that Ashley is here. Um, let me remove that. I'll bring Ashley on in. Hello, can you hear us all right? Yes, I can. Hi, I'm, I'm Michael Wong um, and this is uh, Dr. Chris Levine. So you've got a, a two-year-old English bulldog named Bunny. And I do. Bunny's been having some vestibular-like episodes. Uh, you had an MRI, she was diagnosed with hydrocephalus, um, but the, the neurologist didn't feel that that was the cause of the episodes, tried some medications, some prednisone, gabapentin, and omeprazole, uh, but we haven't seen any positive impact on her condition. Um, concern for are these mini strokes? So, so th these are episodic balance problems, or or has it been kind of the same since it started? Um, so these happen very strangely. Um, usually, there's a head shake, and then she will fall to the right, always to the right, and then she'll start rolling. The rolling is something newer. Um, and now they started off pretty short, and now they're lasting sometimes even over a minute. Um, they happen on an average day at least three to five, maybe more times. But if there's inclement weather, like any kind of cold front coming or a big storm or something like that, um, they'll happen sometimes up to 15 times a day. Dr. Levine? And definitely a lot of episodes. And looking at the videos that you provided before, seeing us roll like an alligator here in Florida, um, the, it, it's definitely heartbreaking to watch. And the hard part is going to become, why are these occurring? With the barometric pressure changes and seeing an increase in the frequency of events, I would give consideration to that is your the hydrocephalus that we were previously diagnosed with is that influencing our balance system and the the relay centers from vestibular up into the thalamus because I, I have not seen the MRI that was done to see how severe the images are, really are. I saw the radiology report, but mm -hmm. hydrocephalus can definitely be a factor in the frequency of these events. And especially when you mentioned the changes with the barometric pressures and the, the weather changes. And in dogs that have severe hydrocephalus, there are some therapies and you're on the right stuff. So the omeprazole has been shown in research studies to decrease the production of spinal fluid. So that's a, a good one to add in from a medical standpoint, short of placing a shunt into the brain and diverting the fluid and taking the pressure down. If that works, great, we were right. But there are definitely dogs that have hydrocephalus and another problem, you could be an epileptic with hydrocephalus and we have to manage both at the same time. So it can be really difficult to come up with a complete plan for Bunny. But right. especially because we can't ask Bunny what, what she feels during an event and get some feedback. Mm -hmm. Do these episodes to y'all um, appear to be vestibular in nature? Or did you feel that maybe they could be a seizure, seizure episode or even a stroke? Because the neurologist that we most recently saw sort of mentioned all possibilities. And since the MRI was sort of inconclusive as to these specific episodes, even the radiologist said there was nothing on MRI that would explain the episodes. Um, you know, stroke was something that the neurologist had mentioned. 
and strokes do happen in dogs. We find them every single day. I had two yesterday, which is surprising. The age group being two years old makes it a little bit lower on my list. And typically we will be able to find some larger vascular events on imaging if they're occurring. So I'm going to say, I think vascular events are lower on my list. There are epileptic foci that can look like seizures or look like balance disorders. So a give and take of both of them, but trying to treat with for your hydrocephalus. And I know placing a shunt into the brain to divert fluid and reduce that pressure inside is invasive and it sounds aggressive, but it could make a difference for your kiddo. Okay. I'm not going to say it will, can't guarantee it because you may have this hydrocephalus and a second problem completely separate and still have to manage. But maybe, is there anything that you can, other than the weather, they're happening every single day? Mm -hmm. We don't, the only trigger that I can see is when we pick her up from daycare, Sometimes like when we get out of the car, it will happen. Um, it can happen on her walk from daycare to the car. So I guess you could say that sometimes with stimulus or excitement that it can happen, um, but that's not always. Sometimes it's just walking across the house, she'll just fall over. With that history, I would, when your brain isn't completely normal, when there's less cells that are functional and you're overstimulated, then that hyper excitement can definitely set you off into a seizure event. But which one is it? I'm, it, you're in a hard situation because I think I would treat for both things like you are, you're just not seeing a major positive improvement. If these are truly just vestibular seizures and that part of the brain, that the thalamus, your, your relay centers between the vestibular nuclei and higher up areas are misfiring, then, well, we could try different anti-epileptic drugs and try to tweak your, your medical therapies to minimize the frequency of these events, or even using an anti-nausea medication, trying Serenia, uh, Miropitin. Mm -hmm. uh, tried that already and didn't. Yeah. And we yeah. haven't gotten any results from that either. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're doing everything right. But I think <laughs> if nothing else is working on a medical standpoint, I would give consideration once I look at your MRI to placing a shunt into the brain and diverting that fluid, reducing the pressure, because if it all if it is all pressure related and seeing that the weather changes exacerbate these issues, maybe we have a, a clinical improvement. Can't okay. say it's gonna work, but I would give consideration. I don't know what you think, Doc. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I have too much too much to add. Um, you're, you're in Savannah? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so, so, so all I can, if, if you've seen doc, Dr. King, he and I sat boards at the same time, and I, I just think he's one of the, the smartest dudes out there. So I, I, I think you're in really good hands, if assuming that's who, who, who you've seen right there in Savannah. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot to add other than, you know, the medications that you're trying. It, it does sound a little, um, you know, the vestibular symptoms along with hydrocephalus, it's, it's uh, a little bit less typical. I, I always think of, you know, hydrocephalus causing forebrain signs, but, you know, absolutely, you know, certainly possible or absolutely possible. So I, I, I think you're doing a lot of the things that you're, that you should be doing. Um, I do have a question. Um, based on what little you guys have seen and read about her, um, do you, have any feelings on like long-term prognosis? And I know that that's something that doctors really don't enjoy answering. <laughs> and it's tough to say, you know, because you haven't had hands on her, but do you have any feelings based on what you've seen, you know, with the limited information that you were provided? I'm going to do, I'm going to punt this one because <laughs> without putting my hands on your puppy and really getting to know you well and see the progression from day one to now, I couldn't be able to give a, a true accurate prognosis, but there are definitely dogs with hydrocephalus, even as severe as it can be that lead fairly normal lives. As long as we are interactive, playful, happy, running, jumping, playing in between your episodes, we're potty trained. We are, a normal member of society, then we keep on keeping on until we stop doing those things. But mm -hmm. I see a lot of dogs with really bad hydrocephalus that can lead fairly normal lives. 
And, and, and kind of the face I made, it's not so much that we don't like answering the question. Um, the, the face I was making was more, it's, it's challenging to answer that question. It's, and it's unfair for us to, to try and um, predict for, for Bunny. You know, it's, it's not fair to Bunny. It's not fair to us. It's not fair to you for us to try and um, give that information based off of the limited information that we have. You know, it's... it's mm -hmm. um, I get that. <laughs> but it, it's not wrong trying to continue working with your neurologist and maybe trialing different anti-seizure medications to see if a little tweak can make a great improvement in the frequency of these events. Or if nothing is working medically, there are still other alternatives of dealing with hydrocephalus to hopefully reduce these events for you. Okay, and real quick, um, for these types of episodes, whether it be um, vestibular in nature or not, um, do we need to be concerned about long-term effects? I love that question. So <laughs> seizure events in human medicine, there are a lot of nuclear scientists and Nobel Prize winners who have seizures. So are there changes that can occur in the brain? Sure. But the good thing is our dogs don't have to operate heavy machinery or do calculus or write sonnets. So long-term effects, I'm not so worried about if they are truly just epileptic in nature. Do they progress? Seizures can absolutely get worse as time goes on as the little cells in the brain that are misfiring, they over time can teach their neighbor cells to misfire and the seizure focus gets larger. So seizures beget seizures. So if we can control them better early on, we have a better long-term way of managing. And that's where I think jumping on this sooner, trialing different medications, seeing what can work for Bunny is going to be important for our long-term survival. Okay. And do you think that the trialing of medications is going to give us the answer if she has epilepsy? Or is there another way to test for that? You don't know. There's not, unfortunately. It's trial, <laughs> treat, and see what happens, unfortunately. I wish okay. there was something happened. All right. Well, thanks, you guys. You got it. All right. Um, we've got a, a couple other questions. J just because uh, we were just talking about vestibular disease, there, there are a couple questions in the comments. Um, you have a treatment protocol for vestibular disease when there's no visible cause. Why do vets prescribe prednisone so loosely, and when should they be prescribed for vestibular peripheral or central? So. Um, I, I, I guess the you know the two questions in there for me are um, how do you approach vestibular how do you approach idiopathic vestibular disease um, I guess how do you approach vestibular disease in general so that that'll kind of get into the talk of central versus peripheral and different causes there um, what's your approach for when you've done all of the tests and actually diagnosed idiopathic vestibular and then um, Kind of for the for the vets out there, um, when should vets consider uh, reaching for steroids when they're presented with a, a dog with vestibular disease? Um, it's a great question, and I think the root cause of it or root question we have to answer is: Is this truly a peripheral vestibular, or something arising from the middle or the inner ear, or is this a central cause and something in the vestibular cochlear nerve as it's traveling up into the brain? or the integration pathways in the vestibular nucleus in our brainstem. And I think on an exam, that, that becomes a very important distinction because different things happen in these different areas. In our peripheral vestibular, we see middle and inner ear infections. Rarely there are tumors in the middle ear. Uh, we see the, the true idiopathic geriatric vestibular disease where there's no cause we ever find. And a lot of that is our exam. So seeing which direction are the eyes ticking back and forth. Do you have side to side, vertical? Vertical is, tends to be something more inside the brain, whereas the side to side tends to be something more in the middle or inner ear. If there's placing reaction, so if you can stand up and have your puppy stand and flip your feet over and see do the signals connect from the nerve up the spinal cord through the brain itself and back down appropriately, that says, all right, if it's working well, it's probably this peripheral vestibular. Um, and so little anatomy, little exam stuff. If there are delays, there has to be something wrong in that central pathway, something in your brain stem that is blocking the signals from your legs going all the way up. And that distinction really dictates where we go. 
if you are an older puppy, you have normal placing responses, your eyes are side to side, which indicates more of a peripheral issue, and it happened really acutely, then we assume that it's this idiopathic vestibular. And usually I'll give time. I give anti-nausea medications because being dizzy kind of stinks and you feel nauseous. And I usually will use omega-3 fatty acids as fish oils because one of my theories is, is there a little mini stroke in that inner ear? Is there a vasospasm? Is there a clot that is blocking up the vasculature to that inner ear causing the off balanceness? And omega-3s can act as a mild anti-clotting agent and they're great for neural repair as well. And maintaining nutrition, making sure that we are trying to walk as much as we possibly can to re innervate and make sure our nerves can heal. And that's my general idiopathic vestibular time, antioxidants, and anti nausea medications. I often don't, in the very acute phase, reach for prednisone yet until the signs keep persisting. Because there probably is some inflammation in that vestibular nerve from any cause, and prednisone can reduce it. So it's still a point of contingency or con contention between neurologists on do we use steroids or not. If you have a central problem, now there's something in your brainstem, in your cerebellum vestibular area, I'm looking for strokes, true hematomas, blood clots, tumors, autoimmune diseases, infections that can go into your brain. And those I will use steroids because it helps to reduce some of the edema that is blocking that signal as it's traveling up and down and sometimes treat the problem. If it's an autoimmune issue, that's part of our therapy. We're knocking back your immune system, but differentiating what are our differentials? Is this more peripheral? Is it more central? Is kind of at the root cause of everything. And that's where having an exam with your primary vet and even a neurologist comes in so that we can guide you in different directions and make the appropriate recommendations for testing. And sometimes it does come down to MRI of your head, sampling spinal fluid. And if we come up with nothing, it's great. You don't have a tumor. You don't have an infection. You don't have a big bleed. You don't have something that is big and scary. And if it's an idiopathic cause, you're going to get better over time for the most part. Um, I don't know if you do something differently down in uh, Miami, but that, that's what I tend to do. Yeah, that, but my, my approach is the exact same. You know, first trying to, to say, is it central versus peripheral? Because it changes our thought process with regards to, to causes and treatment and um, prognosis. Um, and, you know, if we're able to do tests, fantastic. I, I kind of set people up the exact same way that, you know, best news possible is we're going to do all of these tests and everything's going to be normal. That's the, the best news possible. So, um, so, so yeah, in, in general, I, I agree. I, I, I tend to prescribe prednisone more for dogs with um, either I've diagnosed a central vestibular problem, such as inflammatory brain disease, a brain tumor, um, a hemorrhagic stroke, et cetera, um, or I haven't been able to do an MRI to prove which one it is, but based off of my examination alone, I've localized central. So at that point, we're thinking things like, you know, brain tumor, encephalitis, et cetera. So, um, and, and treatment protocol would basically be the exact same, you know, um, for suspected and or diagnosed idiopathic vestibular, you know, time, nursing care, uh, supportive care, et cetera. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hi, Melissa. I think you're on mute. Um, Yes. Hi. <laughs> how are you? Great. Thanks for how joining are you? Us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I we're at the beginning stages of all this, just okay. learning and getting to know what what all of this is about. Um, one and a half year old Siberian Husky purebred. Um, he had his first seizure on January twenty fifth. Uh, we didn't know it was a seizure. We thought he was choking. It was the first time we saw something like that. And he actually had his second seizure yesterday. And this one, it was clear that it was a seizure. Um, it lasted about three minutes. We recorded it. Uh, classic. Started acting as if he was going to throw up. Then it fell on his side. And the paddling, the foam in the mouth, and all those things. Um, staring into space and heavy breathing. Once he came out of it, 
um, he seemed very confused and started doing the pacing, the circling around and seemed even a little bit aggressive. Um, however, within maybe 15 minutes, he followed commands. We told him to sit, he would sit. We told him to lie down, he would lie down, the spin for a treat and everything. Um, but all together, it took about probably three hours for him to settle into comfort and nap. So he is on a grain-free diet. Um, he's on fish oil, zinc supplements. He's allergic to uh, peanuts, eggs, and rice. So we, we have a few things going on. And um, the, after the first episode, we did some blood work. Uh, we did a hard worm test, um, tick disease test. We're in South Texas, so it, it could happen. And everything was normal. So right now we are, what do we do next? Uh, they have told us MRI, more blood work and all those things. I, I honestly don't see an MRI in the cards right now, given the expense. Um, so where, where would you go from here? He's only a year and a half old, so. Yeah, it's tough when we have our young dogs who start having weird events because, well, it, it's hard to watch. And it, a, with our breed, in, a, in being a Husky who is young between the ages of one and five, mm -hmm. that starts having episodes that look the same each time that are normal in between, the high probability is that we are likely an idiopathic epileptic. Uh, without doing all the tests, like you say, MRI, spinal fluid sample to rule out that there's not something actively happening in your brain. We can't definitively say that, but the majority of our dogs, we're going to say, you're the right age, you're the right breed, you're the right onset, you have the right clinical signs, you're probably an epileptic. With epilepsy, the decision on when should we treat becomes a little bit of a discussion with our owners because everyone has a different opinion on how many seizures are too many. Whenever we treat, I think it's always important to note that we almost always will have additional seizure events. They rarely stop even with therapy. Our goal is to make them as infrequent as we possibly can while minimizing the, the clinical signs and the side effects of medications. Because yes, I think you could stop every seizure event in, that you could have, but you'd be in a medically induced coma. So trying to avoid the sedation, avoid the drinking, the peeing, the liver changes, the kidney problems. That's a decision that we have to make it when we discuss with our owners of, hey, when should I start a, a treatment? My general recommendation is if you're having more than one seizure event a month, then I start adding in one medication. And if it does a wonderful job, you have less episodes, they're less severe, they're less frequent, Fantastic, but if it's not working, not every drug works for every single patient. So we have to find that right combination or that right sole agent for Jasper. And I think you had one episode on the 25th, one episode on- 30 dates on the dot. 30, so you're right there. And when is the next one gonna happen? It could not happen for another six months. So I think I need to see a little more trend before I say, yes, I'm gonna relegate you to a lifetime of medication because it's infrequent that I get my Huskies to come off of drugs once I start them. Now, do I expect you to not have an episode for six months? Being a Husky, I think that's going to happen within the next month. I think you're going to be on a medication and whether it's phenobarbital, whether it's Keppra, Zonisamide, potassium bromide, or some of the other newer medications, that depends on underlying lab work. Do you have underlying liver changes, kidney problems? How often can you dose a medication? the cost of the medications, the follow-up blood work. These are the really long discussions that we have to make with all of our patients that have seizures before deciding on a treatment protocol for you. But I think right. you're, you're going to be in for some anti-seizure medication pretty soon. If it's not now and it's not next month, it's going to be in the, in the future. And What is that, I guess, you would say that the long-term effect of the medication, we've talked liver, we've talked to kidney, we've talked all those things, but realistically for a dog that age, what, what are we looking at on side effects? So it depends on the drug that you use. I see more side effects. It, 
we can try to mitigate them by checking blood work periodically, making sure you're not giving too high of a dose. So phenobarbital, I always recommend phenobarbital blood levers, levels, liver panels, bile acid tests, bone marrow, or CBCs to check your bone marrow on, heck, every three to six months, just to make, especially when we're starting, sooner when we're starting, actually. I, I test blood work in a month. But if we start with a medication like Keppra, Levetiracetam, it's a really, it's a pretty safe drug. Many people don't test blood levels. It is excreted by your kidneys nearly entirely with minimal liver metabolism. So I, in my young dogs, I often start with Keppra because it is safer long-term mm -hmm. and only if it's not working, I'll get back towards phenobarbital. But with monitoring blood work, monitoring blood levels, they can be used safely long-term for the majority of our dogs. There can always be idiosyncratic reactions where just because I have three litter mates, just because two of them handle a drug well, number three may not, and you may go into acute liver failure, but the majority with periodic blood work, we can keep you safe long-term. I have many dogs that are on anti-seizure medications, phenobarbital bromide for over a decade, and still they're happy running, jumping, playing, and normal. Yeah, and, and that's how he is, right? This 30 days, he was normal. He he. There was nothing that it would lead you to believe that there was going to be another episode. Now, on supplements, what is there something that we can do? Right now, he's taking zinc, he's taking fish oil, uh, and that's something that we did because he had a skin lesion that, lesion that we thought maybe there's zinc deficiency, right? We didn't test for that, but we started it. So um, it, is there something that we can do to help? Uh, I heard you talking about omega-3 and all those things, how they help recover the, the cells and everything. What would be the dosage on that? And is there any harm in overdosing by mistake, if you would say? Yeah, too many fish oils, because it's an oil, it lubricates the GI tract. And I have dogs that wind up with loose stool and diarrhea. That's the mm -hmm. biggest problem I have. Most of the time when I'm dosing omega-3 fatty acids, I look at the EPA component. So total omega-3 fatty acids are broken down to EPA and DHA. Mm -hmm. I tend to use about 22 milligrams per kilogram of body weight okay. of EPA component per day. And now the hard part is every fish oil, every supplement that's out there, most of them don't have any regulation on them. So you really never know what you're getting in your capsule. Mm -hmm. So using a prescribed uh, fish oil supplement, something that has validation or certifications is going to be better than something that doesn't. Um, but fish oils I like, CBD oils, I can't truly recommend them because it's against what the legal status says I can do at this point in time. Maybe in a couple of years, it'll be different, but they are showing improvement in the frequency of seizures. Again, the same thing with regulation. There's no regulation on them. So you have to find a company that has been tested. And then there's even foods that you can trial. Like Purina makes a food specific for nervous system recovery and nervous system health called NeuroCare. And that has been shown to decrease the frequency of epileptic events in a certain percentage of dogs. So those are the kind of the things I would be looking at as a probable epileptic. Do I start a medication yet? Do I trial going on a new food? Do I trial omega-3s and watch the frequency of events before we start something? But okay. And one, one more thing. Um, seizures, epilepsy, and heartworm <laughs> treatment. There, there is so much controversy about that. And and we, interesting enough, the first seizure happened the day after we did his monthly treatment. So we we chalked it up to that, right? That That's what it did it, and, and this is out of the house now. So, but we're on the next month, and we summer is coming, we're in Texas, and tick, and mosquitoes and everything is, is very common and unfortunately it's a risk for him. What would you recommend in this case? That's a can of worms. So we've just opened up Pandora's box. I know. The, <laughs> Sorry. I don't have many contraindications to using the monthly flea and tick preventatives because the majority of dogs, even that are epileptic, still do really well with them. There's a, a in the research studies that are done, there's a mild increase in the frequency of seizures in dogs that are epileptic, but for the vast majority of our patients, I find that Mo heart guard, neck guard do a really good job and I don't have a problem with them. I don't know if you have a different idea on, on the 
flea tick preventative doc because it's, certainly the, the trifectus we, we try and avoid um you know just the uh trifectus comfortus and you know i mean it's it's um on the label and you know we've got enough other options that you know we try and avoid that you know the, the heart guard um that was something I, I had actually never heard until you know when i was in colorado and one of the neurologists there was you know just very very you know against heart guard sure in theory it makes sense it's just it's such a small dose um i i personally don't see dogs that um when they're on heart guard that they're more likely to have seizures but it's you know the, for, for me the the hard avoids are, are the trifexis comfortus things like that okay Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it, especially when we're just starting, right? Uh, we will. We have a, a blood work and bio, uh, bio assets, correct yep. me if I'm wrong, um, test schedule for Monday. So then we'll go from there. But this, this help and clarification and how everything works, it's thank you. Thank you very much. You got it. Take care. Thanks. Um, we've got a question in the comments here. Where did they go? <laughs> so how likely is a dog to have a second uh, slips disc? My Chihuahua Terrier mix had surgery May 2019. Uh, at that time, we were paraplegic with intact deep pain perception. Uh, she's walking pretty well again, but seems to have a minor flare up every six months or so. She gets PT, she gets acupuncture and she's on gabapentin long term, but I'm nervous she will need another surgery. Uh, stats on that. So I guess uh, likelihood of having a second slipped disc um, and uh, usually the corollary question to this is, is you know, are there any ways to prevent uh, having another slipped disc or having one in the first place? What I tend to see in our patient population is about one in five dogs will have another disc herniation at some point, but the majority of them can be medically treated, where we give anti-inflammatories, pain medications, time and rest, and you get better from it. Kind of like what you've been doing with your flare-ups every six months. Are these other discs without imaging? We're not going to know. Is it the same one? Is there mild instability from surgery? There's lots of questions that we don't know with it without additional imaging, but I tend to say about one in five will have another episode of those, probably 10% will have to cut, maybe 15% will have to have a second procedure. But your Chihuahua Terrier mix, the biggest thing I would try to do to avoid coming to see a neurologist again is limit jumping. I try to avoid jumping on and off furniture as much as we can because it changes the biomechanic forces as the, the bones are compressing that disc. So we're minimizing the ability for it to get put under pressure and then pop out again. So that's what I tend to recommend. I think glucosamine chondroitin supplements are great. Omega-3 fatty acid supplements are great. Maintaining a normal body weight and athleticism. I think those are all what I tend to recommend for my first offenders who don't want to have a repeat offense. Yep. Yep. I've got nothing to add there. So, you know, unfortunately, there's no 100% way of, of preventing it. But all of the things Dr. Levine said are, are all of the things that we routinely recommend just uh, maintaining weight, uh, avoiding high impact activities, uh, etc. cetera. Um, question here. Um, have you ever seen a dog with idiopathic epilepsy that no longer uh, has any seizure episodes after being on medications? And I guess the corollary to that is, um, how, how often have you seen that and what do you do with the medications? Uh, if, if you can talk a little bit about, because um, you know, I think you alluded to it before, is usually when you start medications, um, you know, it's tough to, to come off of them, or at least you were giving that in the example with Jasper. Um, so I guess if you can talk a little bit about um, medications and um, dogs going into re you know, remission or cure and never having a seizure again. I will say it's very uncommon in my practice to see my true it diagnosed idiopathic epileptic dogs that don't have additional seizures. I can probably count on four fingers the number of patients that I've had with good control that never had another episode. And these are the true 
imaging CSF samples. We know you had more than one event. You are a diagnosed idiopathic epileptic. It's a little bit different in our juvenile epileptics. So those that start having episodes under about a year of age, there is a better ability for us to stop episodes from continuing if they're controlled really well early on. But my true idiopathics, it's really hard. And in those I do, so the, the very few patients of mine, I keep medications on for a very long time and I'll slowly reduce if my owners are willing, because most of my owners that don't have seizures for a very long time, they say, ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm not gonna rock the boat. Let's not change anything unless there are metabolic issues that are starting to arise. This is easy. I just keep saying <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to add, but um, um, let me talk a little bit about side effects of, of medication. Kimberly says Kepper made her Yorkie extremely nauseous and uh, the back legs weak and wobbly. Um, she thought Kepper was going to be the most tolerable. So I, I guess if you can talk a little bit about, you know, of our common anti-seizure medications or anti-epileptic drugs, you know, the, the typical side effects of them and... Um... Yeah, so typically I, I think Keppra is my safest medication. Yeah, every dog can re react, every person can react differently to any drug. Um, Keppra being excreted by your kidneys, if there's underlying renal insufficiency, then the body can't excrete it appropriately. Maybe your blood level is higher than we really think. So correlating, do you have kidney problems versus the dose of Kepra that you're on. That's something that your veterinarian can try to help to adjust. But whenever I start any anti-seizure medication, they are all sedative medications. They are reducing your neuronal excitation. They're reducing what your brain is doing. And a lot of my dogs in the initial time frame, one week, two weeks, three weeks, will be more sedate, weak, wobbly. And then they kind of come out of that fog as the body adapts and we develop a tolerance to your medication. But uh, nausea, I'm not common, I don't commonly see that. I see more with potassium bromide because the potassium really irritates the GI tract. And I see more nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, pancreatitis with bromide than anything else. Um, bromide causes a lot more sedation. It also takes a very long time to build up in the system to reach a steady state blood level where it's maximally effective. Uh, bromide doesn't tend to be my first go-to drug anymore unless our dogs have cluster seizures. I find it to be more effective for dogs that have multiples in the same day. Phenobarbital, metabolized by our liver. Uh, we have to keep checking blood values, liver values, bone marrow, and it causes a lot of sedation, drinking, peeing, panting, appetite increase, weight gain, uh, bone marrow suppression. The other drug that we sometimes will use is called zonisamide or zonagrin. Uh, it is metabolized by your liver, so we still have the same liver follow-ups that we have to do. Uh, it is in a class of drugs we call sulfa derivatives. And so zonisamide, just like all sulfa derivatives, can cause dry eye where you stop producing tears. It can cause bone marrow suppression. It can cause liver dysfunction. And those are the things we have to talk about. So I really like Kepra. I think if you just started it, I would give more time for the medication to become adapted in your system or if you have underlying kidney problems, maybe a potential reduction in the dose of the, the medication. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Kepra, you know, we've, we've all fallen in love with it just because it's, you know, has so many less side effects. Uh, um, I agree, I usually don't see nausea with it, so. Um, so Patty asks, if a trusted neurologist suspects a brainstem tumor on the basis of exam, um, what additional information would have been gained by an MRI and spinal tap um, for definitive diagnosis? So, so I, I guess, you know, wh wh when do you actually recommend an MRI, you know, even if there's a strong suspicion and um, if that strong suspicion is, well, gosh, it's going to be a, a brain tumor, um, I guess, how do you coach your, your pet parents on the pros and cons of, of doing an MRI? And then uh, I guess if you can talk a little bit about the, the risks of a spinal tap. So when to perform diagnostic testing is, there's a lot of variables that play in. And some of it de depends on how aggressive my owners are on wanting an answer. Some owners are absolutely adamant. I need to find out what's wrong. I don't care what it is. I just need that information because it helps some people sleep at night. 
Uh, I have definitely other owners that are saying, based on your evaluation, you think it's this, it's probably this, it smells like it, you're the right age, you're the right breed with the right progression. Yeah, testing can confirm. Now, the hard part is sometimes we are wrong. An exam can only tell us so much. So we can say, based on an exam, your problem is in this location. That's our neuroanatomic localization. And then we develop a differential diagnosis list to say, based on the progression of signs, your age, your breed, it's probably this. But there are times that we think it's a tumor and it's an infl inflammatory process. We think it's a tumor, it's a bleed. We think it's a tumor and you have an infection, things that are more treatable. So I tend to push for imaging because I find things that surprise me periodically. Now, even if there is a tumor, it doesn't mean there's nothing you can do for it. There's treatment options of surgical therapy, radiation, chemotherapies. There are experimental trials. There are vaccine treatments where you make a vaccine against your own tumor and give it back to you to go kill off little cells that are still there. Now, still, most of my owners don't do those, and we treat palliatively and keep us as happy as long as I can. But I think that definitive answer does play a role in determining prognosis and saying, what do we think is going to happen in the future? And is there something more I could have been doing? Um, spinal tap, spinal taps are great at identifying things that are microscopic and cellular because MRI can only show us things that are about a millimeter or larger. So still a lot of stuff you can see, but I can't tell you about the individual cells that are there. If there's pressure in the brainstem, if there's swelling, if the mass is right there where we introduce the needle, imaging tells us we don't do it because there is a, a higher risk when there's brainstem pressure of putting the needle into the nervous system. So in the hands of an, a neurologist who we have imaging and we can make that determination on the fly of, is there pressure? Is this, I, is it going to help what, I, what I'm gonna do? Because if you have a tumor, I'm not gonna tap you. If there's inflammation, and it's going to give me more information of what type of inflammation is there, and it's safe to do so, that's when we do our tap. Because if, it, if it's not going to change what I do, we don't do it. So even though it's on the list of things that we could do, MRI and tap, not everyone gets a tap. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing I think for people to understand is, you know, we're, one, we're very systematic about things, and two, we don't like to do tests just simply to do them. We're doing them to try and answer a question that helps us better be equipped to, to help that pet. Um, so I, I, I loved your humility there of, you know, we're, we're wrong all the time. And I, I say that all the time and I'm, I'm glad someone else is, is willing to say it, but you know, people ask me, ah, Dr. Wong, you've been doing this a long time. Just tell me what it is. And you know, my answer to that is the, the longer you do it, the more you realize you don't know until you know, and, um, you know, until you've done tests to prove it. So i um, just like you said, there are dogs where I'm certain they're going to have a brain tumor and they don't. Or dogs from certain there's no way this you know one year old dog is going to have a brain tumor and it does uh, mm -hmm. until we do the tests we, we can't know for sure and that's that's the purpose of them um do, do you ever and and i guess i'm just more curious here do, do you ever do spinal taps without an mri um or is your i can tell your strong mm -hmm. preference is mri first to say one is it safe and two you know is it uh is it necessary, but um, are, are there certain scenarios where you would consider a spinal tap? Sure, it? Um, so my very young dogs where I'm highly suspecting an autoimmune inflammatory disease and their clinical signs are not bad. We don't have a low heart rate. We don't have a poor gag reflex. We don't have brainstem signs. Sure, if I'm suspecting, if you have a young boxer with neck pain and we think he has steroid responsive meningitis, yeah, I'll tap only. And if I get the high percentage of neutrophils, lots of inflammatory cells, we have our answer. But the hard part of tap only, as you know, is it's not always accurate. There can be inf a problem inside the brain causes inflammation, and we're only getting those inflammatory cells out. We're not getting the underlying root cause. So the picture adds a whole lot to it. The spinal tap is the icing on the cake for me in the majority of our patients. That is necessary for, but I definitely will tap only. It's just, it only gives us that small portion of the picture. Great. Um, Jesse has a, another question. Um, you, you had mentioned about pancreatitis as a side effect of Cabrovet. Um, I, I guess if you have a pet or a patient that um, has had pancreatitis, uh, I guess, how, how do you approach that? <laughs> I come off of bromide and I switch to something else because I do. there's a study from, I think, the late 90s that the association of 
phenobarbital and bromide is that there is a higher incidence of pancreatitis with those combination drugs than phenobarbital alone. So the association is bromide can cause pancreatitis. So I try to wean off of bromide if I can and switch to something different, phenobarbital, potassium bromide, zonisamide, um, and diet manipulation, trying to avoid your fatty foods and uh, bland diet. I think that's what I would do in any puppy that continues to have pancreatic flare-ups on bromide is trying to get off that drug. Great. I, 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 we're, we're, we're running out of questions here. We've got a, a question. Um, can you talk a little bit about cerebellar hypoplasia treatment and prognosis uh, from a vet student? So, ah, vet student. Well, congratulations on getting into the profession. We um, cerebellar hypoplasia. This is a fun one because genetically, for reasons sometimes we have no idea about, or due to in utero viral infections different organisms can attack the replicating cells in the cerebellum and cause them to degenerate or not be produced. So cerebellar hypoplasia versus cerebellar abiotrophy. Very similar clinical signs. Our dogs tend to, and cats, tend to stabilize as we get older and accommodate to not having that fine motor control center. Although a lot of our dogs and cats will have jitters and tremors and spastic motions, but it often doesn't unless severe, uh, it often doesn't lead to a dog and cat who's non-functional. So as long as you're okay with having a puppy or a kitty who looks weird and people point to at a party and they say, hey, look at what your cat's doing, it's kind of fun, then they, they do okay long-term. Um, Denny O'Brien out at University of Missouri, I'm not sure if he's still there anymore. Uh, he has a lot of his own personal pets that have cerebellar issues, degenerative problems, a, uh, abiotrophies and hypoplasias. And they run around the farm and yes, they fall over. They can hurt themselves and cause orthopedic issues, but they're happy-go-lucky. They don't know any different. And I think the big thing is usually the, the cerebellar hypoplasia. So I was born this way, you know, they're not getting worse. So um, they, they can have great quality of life. Um, two, two questions that I, I guess I had skipped earlier um, that, that are, are, are really interesting questions. Uh, Alicia says, or Alicia says, five-year-old lab just diagnosed with paroxysmal dyskinesia by a neurologist. We had an MRI and spinal tap. Um, so little data I can find on this, and I agree with that. Um, any diet recommendations or supplements? Sorry. Ooh, that's a hard one because we know so little about these dyskinesias and in humans, they're really well described because we can talk to people. We can get verbal feedback. We can say, yes, gluten-free diet really helped me. And then um, Atkins diet really helped me. In some breeds, um, I'm blanking on a name right now. I think it, I can't remember who it is. Uh, but gluten-free diets, although there's an association with heart disease, so we have to play those two back and forth, can reduce some of the motor dysfunctions that we see with paroxysmal dyskinesias. Um, some dogs respond to Prozac. Some dogs respond to amitriptyline. So there are definitely therapies. More of them are breed associated, but in labs, we really haven't found much in my experience that makes a huge difference in our motor dysfunction. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, 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 is it Border Terrier? There you go. Thank you. I couldn't think of it. Um, so, Carrie, Washington, the UK, my dog is 10 and started eye flickering, muscles going stiff, wobbling, and has most recently gone blind. Not sure if these are seizures. So, I guess, um, Carrie, if, if, if you're watching, can you tell, like, goes blind after the episode and regains vision or has gone blind and, and stayed blind? Um, so, I guess, any thoughts on, on this? And, um, if, if you've got more questions for Carrie, I'll see if she'll be able to answer some. But um, so I, I guess I'll take a, a crack at it. You know, it, it um, when I hear things like eye flickering, you know, wobbling, I I, I, I think of things. So so Carrie says totally blind. Um, so eye flickering is are, are they kind of this rapid movement where it's kind of slow in one direction and fast in the other? I guess when I hear that. I think of a, a balance problem or a vestibular disease um, that we've uh, kind of talked to a, a couple different questions about. Um, but um, usually a seizure, it classically what it looks like is dogs go stiff, 
sometimes it can start off like like um, Jasper's description where it looks like they're they're choking on something. Um, they might salivate. They poop. They pee. Um, it lasts anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. But that tells us there's a problem in the in the front part of the brain. Um, if if your pup has gone blind, that actually makes us worry more because um, I, I sort of think about three things that can cause seizures: things outside of the brain, things inside of the brain, and idiopathic epilepsy. Um, being that your pup is, is 10 years old, idiopathic epilepsy, not impossible, but just less likely. And if your pet has gone blind and it's not just terrible coincidence that, that we've started having these episodes and we've developed a, an eye problem to go blind, um, it, it makes me worry more that there's a physical structural problem in the brain as the cause for these episodes, assuming they're seizures. Um, so... You know, if you haven't gone to your, your, your vet, I would absolutely uh, go to your vet. Um, if these things are, are constant, it's something that's relatively easy to, to take your pet there and they can evaluate. If it's something that's more episodic, many times getting a video before you go into the veterinarian or the veterinary neurologist can, can help so that we can better understand what these eye flickerings look like, what the muscles uh, going stiff. So, um, so I, I would... <laughs> You know, if, if you don't have neurologists nearby, um, an ophthalmologist um, would at least be able to better tell us, hey, do I think this is an eye problem for blindness or a neurological reason for blindness? Um, and even if it's one of these things where you can get into the ophthalmologist tomorrow, but not the neurologist for two weeks, um, which is usually the opposite, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I would grab that, that appointment as soon as possible. Um, yeah, it looks like Carrie said that we are totally blind in, in one of the comments. And yeah. so I agree, I think looking at, is this a retina problem? Is it an eye problem versus is it more uh, centrally located around optic chiasm? Are these partial seizures because something is happening at that juncture of where the, the nerves are entering into the brain? So uh, I think definitely getting checked out, getting seen by a veterinarian and probably ophthalmology neuro uh, would be ideal. All right, I'm going through the comments one last time to see if there are any questions that we we we, we missed. Um, there, there, there's there's one that it was kind of the, this we, we had addressed in a different uh, different comment of of you know is going up and down stairs um, bad for IVDD dogs. Um, and uh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> what's that? Lots of questions pop up right here, right at the end. Oh, are there? I, I, I'm, I'm scrolling up, up top. So um, I don't know if you want to take a, take a crack at this. This is well outside of the, the realm of things that I, uh, um, you know, pancreatitis and, and hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Um, Ooh, that's a, that's a, that's a hard one. I would say I would consult an internist because gastrointestinal tract is definitely outside what I do, but diet pancreatitis absolutely can be diet related. So trying to avoid fatty foods, um, trying to avoid changing diets so that we don't overstimulate the pancreas to release enzymes. Um, but clostridium is tough to get rid of. Uh, so humans, I mean, we have people that have C diff, uh, causes horrible diarrhea, horrible gastrointestinal pain. And there are humans that succumb to that. People die from clostridium infection. So I would definitely, if you have clostridium, I would definitely get into with an internist, someone who deals with the gastrointestinal tract and have them be your primary point person. Yeah, so two, two last questions here. Uh, we're, we're coming up on two o'clock and I don't know if you've got a hard stop at two o'clock. Um, if you do, we can... Um, so qu question here, why so many young and premature sick dogs are coming down? Um, wh whether, you know, whether, whether we're talking about internal medicine problems, autoimmune, neurological, GI, orthopedic, you know, wh why are so many, why are we seeing so many more sick pets? Um, and uh, I, I guess I think there are a couple different ways to, 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 to look at that, um, you know, of, of are we seeing more sick pets because there are more pets out there and more pet parents that are, you know, looking for a high level of care for, for their dogs and, and cats, or is it, um, as I'm, I'm reading your, your question, I apologize if I'm misreading it of, you know, are we, are we creating, you know, the, these problems? Um, so. Yeah, that, that's, that's 
a wonderful question because I often ask the same things is why are we seeing so many weird things? I have more juvenile patients with tumors than I've ever seen. And are we finding it more because we're doing more additional testing? We're getting MRIs, we're doing CT scans more than we were 10 years ago. Or is there a difference in the breeding? Are we having more people who are not being diligent breeders? Um, I love my breeders, don't get me wrong, uh, but the uh, there are definitely people who don't do a phenomenal job of trying to weed out health problems from their lines. Um, are there problems with diet and environmental factors, vaccinations? This is something that no one's ever gonna be able to answer. But yeah, I hate seeing all of these young dogs develop these immune system disorders. We see a lot of autoimmune encephalitis, GME, in young patients. And I wish we knew why. I think there's a lot of factors, both environmental and genetic, that we're probably not going to be able to have a good answer in the next 10, 15 years, maybe in 20. But if we can breed out dogs that do have these juvenile health problems and not keep them in our, our breeding pools, I think that would potentially reduce the number of severe illnesses we see in our young patients. Yeah, no, it's a it's a, a great question. A question that I think needs needs answering. It's a it's a huge question, and it's it's not one that I'm I'm sure that I've I've got a, a satisfactory or you know all, all of the answers to. But it, it's absolutely the question that should be, be be being being asked right now. And then the last one, Sarah. Here we go. Um, my my dachshunds on caprofenobarbital and zanisamide. We are supposed to give medications at 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, so I feel this is a, a common question, and I think your, your answer will, will probably uh, help a lot of people because this is a super common question. You know, what what happens if I'm um, off by an hour? Do I do I need to you know um, give them exactly at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And what happens if I if I miss the dose by 30 minutes, an hour, four hours? For the vast majority of my patients, I say a little leeway here and there is okay. You still have to live your life. You have to take care of yourself first. And heck, things happen. I work long hours sometimes, and you do too. So we're not always there for the every 12-hour medications. The Some of my dogs, I'll give three times a day drugs, and I go right before I leave for work, right when I come home, and right before I go to bed. Yesterday, that was 7 in the morning, 10.30 at night and midnight. So I know that some doses are a little closer, some are a little further away. Make your schedule what works for you. Um, there are very few dogs, there are some. I have had a couple German Shepherds, a couple mm -hmm. Pointers, a couple Shelties that needed their medication every single, I mean, they, it couldn't be off by a half hour, but it's very few and far between. Right. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. The vast majority are gonna do fine. You know, I, I say those exact same words to uh, to pet parents, you know, just hey, you need to be able to live your life. You know, don't, 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 don't leave dinner early. Back when we were able to go out to dinner and whatnot, but uh, don't leave dinner early. You know, to to get home and give the the seven o'clock dose. So, um, but we should be aiming. So my follow up is usually, you know, I know I just said it's okay. At the same time, we should endeavor to give it as close to the the regimen times as possible. Um, well, awesome. This was uh, fun for me. I hope it was uh, fun for you. I hope it was useful to people that are watching. And, uh, you know, I don't know, this, this felt very natural. I don't know if any of you know, Dr. Levine and I have actually never met before. And I don't think we've ever even spoke before. We've probably emailed or, or texted before. So um, we, we have, we, we, we talked once. Um, I, was, I was in Colorado on a trip and I was, uh, I was calling him to ask him if he needed a job once he got done with his residency. Yeah. So we have spoken once before, like nine, eight years ago. 2012 was was the last time. <laughs> and maybe at the Seven Conference, not uh, the Southeast Vet Neurology Conference. Not, I've I don't never know. never been there. there. You've never been to Seven? Never gone to it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I should. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, and uh, I appreciate your time and your expertise. I, I think you helped a lot of uh, people on their pets today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, and uh, any anytime you need. I'm always around. You got it. I'm going to hit you up. All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.